Hey guys, welcome to my channel Sameed Dama which is a journal of thoughts and experiences that I believe in and that I think are worth sharing. He is Allah, that there is no God worthy of worship except for Him, the King, the Holy, the one free from all defects, the giver of security, the watcher over His creatures, the mighty, the compeller, the supreme. Glory be to God, high is He above all that they associate as partners with Him. He is Allah, the creator, the inventor of all things the bestower of forms. To him belong the best names. All that is in the heavens and the earth glorify him, and he is the almighty, the all wise. So these are, I would say, the two, potentially the two best verses that summarize for us. You know, so, right, so it's an attempt to use yeah. a multiplicity of virtues to, to define a, a supreme source of good. Is it really an attempt to define an ultimate source of good? Did hijab really define God? And can God really be defined? Consider this passage written by Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. The pagan pluralist protests that since everything is an aspect of the real, everything that is worshipped is worshipped truly. According to him, a tree is nothing but a theophany of God's names. So is every stone that we see and everything else. Is not every conception of God and every concretization of that conception an idol? This is a brilliant objection that is being highlighted by Sheikh Murad over here. This was exactly what the poet Nas Khyalvi was saying in his poem earlier. As soon as you think that you have a conception of God, or that you have understood God, or that you have defined God, or that you have, you know, in some way grasped God, as it were, right then if you pay attention to your hands, you'll see that you actually have an idol in your hands. You don't have a definition of God, you have not grasped God, but instead you have an idol in your hands, right there. When Muhammad Ijab was reading the translation of the Quranic verses, he did not posit a definition of God. The Quran does not define Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran instead provides what the philosopher Mortimer Adler calls a definite description of God. In other words, hijab is not giving a definition of God. Hijab is actually giving a description of God. There's a difference there. To exactly understand the difference between a definition and a definite description is not the purpose of this video. If you are interested, you can refer to the book How to Think About God uh, by Mortimer Adler. A link has been given in the description box and you can read the book online for free on archive.org. Anyway, the point that I was trying to make was that you cannot have a conception of God, you can't have a definition of God. In other words, God is not something that can be encapsulated uh, uh, and packaged, as it were, by the human mind. All you can have is a description of God. Any definition would be lacking because it will be by its very nature reductive. However, we can give a definite description of God about which we can be certain. We can say that God cannot be any contingent entity, that is to say anything that could have been another way. We can say that God cannot be contingent. For instance, we can say with certainty that God cannot be an extremely mighty warrior or an extremely beautiful lady or an extremely wise thinker or anything like that. All of these contingent entities are limited in their might, in their beauty, and in their wisdom respectively. They are idols. As monotheists, we can affirm with certainty that idolatry at best is an unbalanced fixation on the attributes of God. It is exactly here, with the certainty of the monotheist, that the monoculture is unhappy with the monotheist. The tolerance boundary of the secular and liberal power is manifest in its relationship with ethnic and religious minorities. They are only respectfully tolerated as secularized and ideologically dominated subcultures. Anything more is unacceptable. Boundless tolerance does not exist. The secular liberal likes to pat on the head of a acquiescent monotheist. To him, only a servile monotheist is a respectable one or a tolerable one. The so-called multiculturalism is in reality monoculturalism. But the confident monotheist insists that his beliefs are special and should not be relativized. Here is where the monoculture is unhappy with monotheism. It appears nostalgic, here as elsewhere, for the classical world. The ancients allowed the gods of Greece and Rome and Egypt to coexist. The one was beyond adequate conception and hence inadequate conceptions represented by Mercury, Athena, Isis and Anubis were all we could know. The epistemic pessimism of this interpretation by Greek models shaped the cosmopolitanism of the ancient world. This is the logic of the so-called multicultural but in reality monocultural 
interfaith interactions that we so often see around us. Claims that one theology might discredit another are regarded as discourtesy, potentially disruptive of social cohesion. We join hands and dance together as non-judgmental equals around the altar of the unknown God. This is Enlightenment's ultimate subversion of faith. Pluralists insist that to attribute real descriptive truth to one's claims about God disrupts social harmony. Orthodoxy of any kind is therefore religiously excluded from the parallel universe of liberal interfaith. Yet believers do wish to know what is true, not merely what is socially useful. But how do we know what is true? If we cannot define God, how do we come up with a definite description of God? Well, from a purely philosophical perspective, we describe God as the necessary being or wajibul wujud as the Muslims would say. This description of God as the necessary being is sufficiently strong for us to utilize it to prove that God exists. And this is exactly what the contingency argument does. Uh, people interested in this argument can uh, have a look at the description box. I have put some resources there and you can refer to them. But you see, believers do not know God as only the necessary being. We also know God as the merciful the compassionate, the manifest, the hidden, and so on. The question now arises. The attributes of God, how are they knowable? They are known through the revelation. Only a high doctrine of revelation can secure a God who is more than our descriptions. And the word must be made word, or else we are lost in argumentation. Only when he has said that he is just, do we truly know that he is just. And only when his justice is shown in a detailed sunnah, do we know how it applies. Any other justice is simply an imposition of our own will on others. So for instance, the monocultural conceptions of justice are usually utilitarian. And about utilitarianism, we can say, Utilitarian altruism is imperialistic. It dictates to people that what is right and wrong is connected with a subjective sense of pleasure. And that somehow this intimately subjective experience rests upon a rationally deducible universal principle that binds all human subjectivity. This is nothing short of colonization of the human conscience. The attributes of God, how are they knowable? Is that only through relationship with the with the book? Or is that is that also does that also have an experiential element as far as you're concerned? The very relationship with the book is the experiential element. As far as knowing God experientially is concerned, an interesting parallel between Islam and Christianity can be made. By the way, I'm not drawing this parallel myself. Like I'm borrowing this idea from one of Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad's lecture, which I'm unable to find at the moment. I just can't uh, find the link for it. Otherwise, I would have just like inserted the uh, audio of the lecture because it was just an audio. So in Christianity, we have this ritual called Eucharist. During the Eucharist, Christians consume uh, leavened bread and wine. The bread symbolizes Christ's body and the wine symbolizes Christ's blood. It is believed that during the Eucharist, the bread and wine transubstantiates into the body and blood of Christ, which for the Christian is the word made flesh. Now, to be honest, like Muslims are disturbed by the clear cannibalistic undertones of such a ritual, but um, nevertheless, an interesting comparison here can be drawn, which is as follows. Instead of ingesting and later excreting, the bread and wine, which is transubstantiated word made flesh during the Eucharist, the Muslim inhales and exhales the word made word by resonating with the Quranic recitation. So uh, what I can do, in fact, is I can recite for you a couple of verses from the Quran. In a sense, it's like giving you something to taste rather than right, just right. explaining what it tastes like. Sure. Do, okay. do what you will. <laughs> When we're talking, so you sang those verses, and then, so here's what happened. I asked you that question. You sang those verses or chanted them, it's, or, or a combination them. of those yeah. two. Okay, but there's a, there's a melodic element to that. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand the language. Mm -hmm. And then you translated them. And so why approach the answer to, to my question in that manner? Because we believe that the Quran in its original language has 
an element in it or has a, has a virtue, if you like, to it or an attribute to it, which cannot be felt or experienced phenomenologically, if you like, mm-hmm. through um, tr- just mere translation. We believe and so, that. Yeah. And so what, what purpose does that serve in a discussion with someone like me? What it will do, hopefully, because we believe the Quran has divine qualities itself. The Quran itself mm-hmm. has divine qualities. So mm-hmm. we believe, number one, it's a cure. We, we believe it's, a phys- it's actually a physical cure as, as well as a spiritual cure. We believe that it's a guidance. We believe that uh, it's, it's something which will literally put you in a psychological state of ease. So in a sense, what it will do, it hopefully, you know, will have an effect on you, which is physiological, maybe psychological. Muslims know God experientially by resonating with the Quranic recitation and with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on. It is by means of this resonance that we come closer to Allah.